I am unashamed. What about you? All right, welcome back to Unashamed. We uh, we know this will be a little bit later, it'll be after the 4th when you hear this podcast, but for us, we're recording it uh, the day before uh, July the 4th, and so we're still talking a lot about our big event we had at, uh, yesterday at WFR, which is our home church, as well as Jason and Missy's um, estate. It's called the Logtown Estate, uh, which is the oldest house in in our parish, which is pretty amazing. And uh, they've turned it into like a bed and breakfast. It's a really cool place. And they basically just said, you know, invited America uh, through Unashamed Nation. And we had a lot of folks show up. A lot of folks got baptized. The gospel was kind of, I would say, the central core. Uh, and uh, the the girl that does our uh, Unashamed Nation on Facebook, she was in town last week and uh it was really amazing to get. I hadn't met her yet, so I'd met Steve, but I had met her, and uh, she uh, did the announcements uh, for us yesterday, which was really kind of cool. You know, just a connection, and she talked a lot about the church and celebrate recovery and what that meant to her. So it's just kind of a it was a cool thing, Zach. I mean, it was it was really neat to see Unashamed Nation get to be a part of what we're doing at our church and also in Washtenaw Parish and just getting to support that. So we appreciate everybody coming. Yeah, that is cool. We, uh, it was funny. I had somebody there with a little booth cause y'all had booth set up. So Beth set up a little table where we sold t-shirts, the one that Phil's wearing, uh, we sold out, but we had the one that we were selling and she said that the, they kept complaining about it because she said they, we have to come up with a bearded edition because the, the symbols, the gospel symbols were too high up on the chest of the men's sh- shirts and their beards were covering. <laughs> so they said, you got these in a beard edition? And I said, I never thought about a beard edition T-shirt. But so I'm going to have to rethink uh, our T-shirt designs to make sure they account for long beards that cover up our graphics. <laughs> there were a lot of uh, men with very long beards. I mean, in, in a lot of cases, I felt like, you know, a little psychiatrist with my little starter beard compared to some of the people that were there. Do you notice that? I know I didn't I didn't notice it, but I just saw a lot of beards. Yeah. I just thought it was some of the boys. <laughs> some of the boys meeting up. Yes, I think it was some of the it boys. Was some of the boys. <laughs> well, uh I'll tell you this, we had a first I laughed last night about this and because uh, Missy was like, I think that was the largest you know, crowd that we ever had because we do events there. You know, people do weddings. I was like, oh yeah, that that was for sure. But she also said, well, you know what happened? It was a, this was a first for me, and I was like, the first. I mean, here's my wife. I won't say how old she is because you know you're not supposed to do that. But she did say that there was a something happened in the proceedings, and it was a first time ever. And she revealed it to me, and I was shocked at what it was. She said, through the course of planning this event, I had my first phone conversation with your dad. I said, really? You've never had a phone conversation? That's right. (laughs) Well, we don't have to say how old she is, but you have been married 30 years, so it's been at least 30 years. I I noticed it, and and it's a, a story about I never take or give advice to your wife. You never do that? Is that why y'all just, never had a phone conversation? Just leave it up to you. <laughs> yeah. You married, not me. Yeah. She's a good woman. So I was interested <laughs> to see what Phil's take on the conversation was. I was like, well, how did this happen? And she said, well, she planned the event. And so she had, you know, my daughter and her uh, camp friends led worship, which they did spectacular. I mean, you know, you're talking about warm the soul. You're talking about trying to find hope for the country. We had a little team Mm -hmm. of, I mean, six or eight uh, teenagers in early 20s who were just, who planned and did the worship. And and it was fantastic. I mean, these people are going places from a voice uh, perspective. But so she was, uh, she had me speak. You know, we did the gospel on the porch, which I I thought that was a great idea. We did that the whole event. But she was going to have Phil uh, pray for our country after I spoke. So she called down there and just to, you know, ask if you would do that. 
So, but Kay answered the phone, and you know how Kay is. When she answers, well, that that's like a roadblock if you were going to talk to somebody else, you know, because she's like, Kay just started, because cause Kay, anybody that's ever talked to Kay on the phone, which, when you call her, she almost starts mid-conversation, and and it's like you were just saw each other, but you didn't. But yep. she, she, she said that went on for a while. And uh, for some reason, either Kay swallowed a bug or she, she, something happened to her voice and she could not <laughs> talk. And she started, you know, saying, she, Missy said she just, she was saying like, water, you know, water, water. <laughs> we've all so, been there <laughs> so she said talk to phil which is the whole reason missy was wanting to call anyway so it was almost kind of a weird providential event because that's that's what she was calling for and so she asked you if you would pray after that but she i was like well was there a lot of yep and nope, she's like, oh, that was, from his end, that was the entire conversation. <laughs> she said, I would say something, and I would get a yep or a nope. And I was like, well, that is having a conversation with Phil on the phone. And I was That's like, right. well, did he tell you bye? And she went, no, I, I didn't realize the conversation had ended until your mom cranked back up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, found her voice. Almost sound like something that you study. <laughs> oh we laugh we laugh i don't know why that was so funny maybe it was just you know knowing y'all but i've noticed but i will say <laughs> dad's phone the dad's phone conversation as he's gotten older has become shorter and shorter because in the old days people would call and i mean sometimes dad would have a long conversation on the telephone like like other people do but i've noticed as dad's gotten older it's get get to the point. Well, what do we got? Yep. Nope. Okay. Bah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a yep, nope, yep, nope. Bah. But then that led to another combustible arrangement that I've been married over 30 years and didn't realize it. Because she said, well, yeah, it's just, it's so rude when you don't tell me bye. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, you never say bye. And now I see where you get it from. And I was like. Well, I'm not saying bye because I'm going to see you later. And she said, well, say that. Say see you later. She's like, you just end the conversation. So and, I didn't. And you wonder why I don't want to talk to your wives. That's yeah. what I <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're defining it right there. Yeah. Do what? So I, don't, I didn't notice that I don't say bye on a conversation. So then I thought, am I supposed to say that? I mean, I, I was here to get advice what is the protocol for that see she took by and decided that you were never coming back no i don't <laughs> say bye i just hang up that means you'll be back well all right i mean i usually say well she figured out better after all I these years because I've, I've yeah i've always wondered every phone call i've ever been on with phil you or jace has has ended very abruptly and I'm always like, is it over? But I mean, I know it's over because I hear the click, but there was <laughs> there was no closure. But now I realize that it's actually endearing that you're saying, I'm going to see you again. This ain't it. Yeah. Well, I'm, no, just, I, I yeah. haven't been saying that. I thought I got to start somewhere. And I thought maybe see you later would be a good closing. So, yeah, because you don't want to have to go into the whole philosophical. This isn't really goodbye. It's just. Till we meet again. I yeah. mean, because you're just it's like just never occurred to me to say bye bye. I mean, I would tell <laughs> no, a little no, no, kid the best that, I've ever got. You know? The best I've ever got from any of y'all. I don't use. I don't. I don't say <laughs> bye bye. You know, I never thought about it, but I mean, no, it just doesn't seem like something that's appropriate in that setting. <laughs> but now that I realize that all of y'all have been offended over the years and have never said a word. Do I not uh, do it either, Zach? I don't say goodbye either. Um, no, you say bye. You have. I usually say yeah, bye. Yeah, you say some form there's, of. There's some kind of greeting. You know that conversation's the conversation's yeah. over, right? Yeah, the, I mean, if if you're lucky with Phil, if I mean, but you got to be. This uh, this is a rare occasion. You might get at the very end, uh, yeah, and then and then it's over. But you got like a <laughs> some kind of acknowledgement that like 
I was, you know, yes, we, we had a conversation. This, this is the end of, but it's just like, a, yeah. And then boom, it's, it's over. <laughs> I think but I, that's you, rare. I say that as all right. All right. I'm then I, I'm saying all right as I'm clicking the end phone conversation. All right. Okay, I guess I'll work on that. It'll be interesting to see Unashamed Nation chime in on that. Is it rude not to say bye? Well, and I use it even with y'all, even with ch- with uh, text and all that. It's just I've learned just to be short and brief and get to yeah, the Yeah, you got to get it in there quick. I mean, right. That's, Zach's that's, learned that too. So it's like yeah. we're, we're unoffendable, but it is kind of different. But I kind of enjoy it too because if I do call any of, any of you guys, there's never like – there's no like – um icebreakers which is i i love i'm like let's get let's, it's like i know the expectation is if you call then, then give me the reason get it out quick because i may not stay here long so I'm just i like, see how i'm offending so many people because when people call me and say well how are your tigers doing i i immediately respond with what do you want because <laughs> what <laughs> Why small are you calling me? Ask you. You can go look that up. Now you're getting my <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. In other words, it, to me, hello. It, it, I'm like, no. no, you don't say hello. <laughs> I say <laughs> yes. You want yeah. something to say? Yeah. You've called me. Yep. Something on your uh, mind? I do the same thing. You're gonna you're gonna chastise me. You're gonna okay. hey, well, great. You're doing great. You're but following. I'm, waiting, I'm saying yes, and I'm waiting on what is it? Okay. Yeah, see, see, people who say hello, I don't, I don't get the hello. You know who it is. It's caller ID. Yeah. Well, that's right. You're right. You don't have to announce yourself anymore. But I called Dad a few months back, and I was like, "You ready for your lesson tomorrow?" So I knew. You know, you just charge right into it, right? Yeah. You ready for your lesson tomorrow? He said, "Yep." He said, "Who is this?" <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better than Sai because because Sai, the first ten years that I saw him on a phone, he got out of the military. He had a problem. I've shared this before. That psychologically, he thought the further away this person is from me, the louder I should talk. Yep. So he would be real loud on the phone. And I'm like, why are you hollering, Ty? Why are you hollering? But he never would say that. But then I realized that in his mind, technology, he's thinking, well, they're in Mississippi. So I really need to talk loud so they can hear me. Yep. And uh, so finally I confronted him about it. We had a nice argument. And then he 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 started realizing that, it doesn't matter as long as we can hear you. The distance is a non-factor. That's funny that we and that's cla- and that's classic side. It's because he's spending a lot of time in different places around the world. So, uh, Dad, on the last time uh, we talked about Tommy John on our podcast, which is one of our sponsors, which is a company that I love, and I've been using Tommy John underwear for years, even before they became sponsors on the podcast. You mentioned that you were out, and so I've in the process of getting you some more. Uh, but the the problem is with the regular underwear. Uh, you know, you get a lot of holes in there. You got a lot of sweat going on You're in the summertime. You need some good, dry, wicking, cool, comfortable underwear. Is that a, is that a fair statement? Well, I have many many topics that I could expound on, but uh, my underwear is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever we live in a strange world, you go for it. Yeah, they're good underwear. About the best I've seen. I'm glad you're playing along, Dad. For I try our, not our to friends. discuss my underwear in public. It's one of the few places that we can do it on the Unashamed podcast. Yeah. Uh, because we love Tommy John underwear. They say they don't have uh customers, they have fanatics. And I would consider myself one of those. Uh they have a best pair you'll ever wear. Or it's free guarantee. So, you know, there's you have nothing to lose by giving these guys a try. And prom- I promise you, you're going to love them. Uh, shop Tommy John's Summer Collection and get 20% off your first order at tommyjohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details. So you all want to get into Luke 7? I think we left off. At, I, I think we left off. We decided... Because of the two stories in Luke 7, the faith of the centurion 
And then this, which I thought was fascinating, Jesus raising a dead person, which this has only happened, uh, like we said, three times, I think, where in the Gospels, where someone was was raised as a as a miracle and which were you know a temporary nature because these people all died later but it just introduced the idea that this is possible so i really love that that story in luke 7 11 it's the only time it's recorded it's not in the other gospels but it's a small town called Nain. Uh, they approached the town. A dead person was being carried out. And I told you about the historical aspect of it. When I visited Israel, the modern day name is just a real small community, but it's it's basically a lot of caves and a, and a graveyard is what it's known for. So it makes sense. And uh, the large crowd from the town was with her, and the Lord saw her. His heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. You know, we made a big deal about that. Jesus is the only person that could get away with that. And then he went up, touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were filled with awe and praise. They praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Then we're going to skip this next uh, paragraph about John the Baptist because there's a lot in here. So we may have to do two on that. But when you get down to verse 36, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sitter. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. So he tells him a parable. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon said, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt. You have judged correctly. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. A lot um, in the story. It's in my opinion, it's sort of the, the continuation of what he did back in Luke 5, which was back then it was a leper and a paralytic and then a tax collector. He kind of continues, Luke does the same thing because, as Jace mentioned, it was a Roman centurion's servant, which is not only a Gentile, but then a servant of a Gentile, which is, these are people that you wouldn't associate with as a Jewish rabbi, the widow and her dead son, and then, of course, this woman. So my first question out of this text that I had, because, you know, when you first read it, you wouldn't really know, but once you kind of see Simon's, who's the Pharisee, his attitude the first question I had was, why would he even invite Jesus over to begin with? Because there had to be a reason why. So, I mean, because it wasn't just because he obviously thought he was great. He may have thought he was great, but I don't know. What What do you think? What do y'all I think? I think is it the, was the hoopla that he was stirring. And yeah. it's like most religious leaders, if there's a hoopla, they want to go check him out and see if he's official. 
I mean, that's a terrible thing to say, but it's just or the way. Or it could be a setup. I mean, it could be the old, you know, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. So I, I've always kind of thought maybe this was in some way. I mean, these guys seem to be like they were constantly trying to trap Jesus. So it's kind of hard. You know, I'm, I'm going to, the motive I'm going to assign would be probably more some kind of trap just because I see that in the character of a lot of the Pharisees. You know? And you see him doing that a lot throughout. Yeah, I think both of those would be applicable. I, I think it's safe to say because of the way he treated Jesus in a setting where a host had certain responsibilities, it certainly wasn't because he loved him, respected him. No, I agree or, with that. Or, yeah, or, he, he, or he wouldn't yeah. have treated him the way he did. No, he, he was in their culture. I read a uh, book one time. I wish I would have looked it up. I didn't know we were going to go down this road, but like written from a guy who lived in this culture, who's a believer. But this was one story he brought up that it was like, because it wouldn't mean much to us, I guess, if you invited somebody over to supper. And because you wouldn't know, we don't have these customs about entering the house. But in their culture, that was, <laughs> that was like a sign of, I don't, I don't like you. I mean, I'm going to let you in because I'm supposed to and supposed to be hospitable, but I'm not giving you all the bells and whistles of. So he, he would have been. Yeah. somewhat uh that would have been more tense because he was not rolled out the red carpet is i guess yeah. some it's it's interesting that verse 29 chapter 7 all the people even the tax collectors when they heard Jesus the words acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John so at least even though the spirit was not given until Jesus died and was res resurrected John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. The Pharisees had experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves. They, they, because they had not been baptized by John. I think he makes a point of that, that people who are, are not in a, in a, in a mindset of repentance if, if it's just trying to work the bad news, give bad news. When the Pharisees had invited, he saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what mm -hmm. kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. I mean, yeah. they're like, yeah. you, you know, we're not sinners, but, but that's the opposite what's going on here. No, it's a valid point, and we're going to get into that when John the Baptist, because you have this statement, that when he says uh, no human, there's never been a greater human born of a woman than John the Baptist, but he who's the least in the kingdom is greater than he. Well, people don't understand what that means. They're like, well, do what? How? Well, it makes no sense. But to your point, John the Baptist was predicting the kingdom. and But even being outside of the kingdom's arrival, you could be as close to, to it as possible, which John the Baptist was, and but he actually wasn't like a, wasn't in it. So he was he to your point, he was preaching about repentance. Everything was like, you yep. know, turn or burn here. Yep. And so then when a Pharisee sees this, he's like, Well, that's not the type of person who who who's in. Why 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 are you you know, they're wanting to their draw problem a line. Was in here. Well, exactly, which is complicated to explain, yep. but I, I think that's a valid point. Yeah, I think the que the question that's coming up here really is this question of who who gets to touch Jesus. Like who gets, if this guy is a son of God, what kind of person is he going to associate with? And and the first person that pops that popped in my mind when Phil was reading that from the Old Testament was David, a man after God's own heart. And if you remember the story correctly, he he has an affair with Bathsheba, sees her bathing on the roof. He goes after her, pursues her. I mean, he like plans it and plots it. I mean, there's like no way out of this. He he goes and, and has a relationship with her. She gets pregnant. But what does he do? Instead of repenting, he just doubles down on it. So he tries to get the husband, Uriah, to come back and, hey, I want you to go be with your wife. And, and he But he has so much integrity that he won't do it. He sleeps out on the uh, with all the other soldiers out front or all the servants out front. Next night, he gets him drunk and tries to send him back over there. Still, he's this guy's high high integrity. David obviously didn't have that in that moment, 
And then ultimately, when he refused to sleep with his wife so he could blame the pregnancy on her, David sends him to the front line, pulls the troops back, and basically murders him. And and then remember the story with Nathan the prophet came in and, and was like told told him this whole story that basically outlined him, but told it like it was somebody else. And the scripture says that David just burned with anger, and he said, you know, we we need to kill this guy. And he's, he needs to pay him back, however many fold. And Nathan's response was, you are that guy. And the reason why I bring that up is because I think, man, this is a guy who he was a man after God's own heart, but he obviously had a ton of sin. Uh, he had a huge debt before God, like just like in this story, he had a huge debt. And when confronted with his sin at the moment that the, the uh, Nathan confronted him, he could have justified it. He could have killed him. He could have whatever, he, but that's not what he did. He, he fell on his face before a living God and he, and he repented. And I was going to read this in Psalms 51, which is the, the psalm of repentance that David Hang on, wrote. Zach, before you okay. read that, let's take a break. So I got good news, uh, Jace and Dad. Um, this is a good news podcast. Would that be fair to say? Unashamed is a good news podcast. Mm-hmm. So we talked about a new product on the podcast that uh, one of our sponsors, Liver Health Formula. And I didn't realize it until these guys made me aware that liver health is super important for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the American Heart Association indicates that people with a fatty liver are three and a half times more likely to have heart failure than those without. It's about 100 million people in America uh, that that struggle with this. And I'm one of those, apparently, that was there because last time I got my liver enzymes checked, mine were up. And so I started taking this product and I just got uh, new numbers uh, recently and my liver enzymes were back in normal range. So uh, this product works. It's worked for me. So that's why many people like me who have that sluggish, fatty liver, uh, you want to lose weight and gain energy. So we want you to check out this product. I've tried it. It works. It helped me. Uh, you can receive a free bottle of blood sugar formula, which I take as well, uh, that reduces your sugar cravings when you order. So check them out. Liver Health Formula by going to Get Liver Help dot com slash unashamed and you're going to get that free bonus gift so check them out get g-e-t liver help dot com slash unashamed i know this is long but i think it, it makes such a good point um i won't read all of it but he he, he says wash me uh he, he asked he asked him to judge him not based on on what he has done but based on God's loving kindness. So he's asking for a different type of judgment. He says, judge me, judge me based on your kindness and compassion. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and my and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And then when you skip down to the end of this, he says that the, the he says, You don't want sacrifices. God doesn't want your sacrifice. He says the sacrifices that are pleasing to God, not the burnt offerings, not the sacrifices. You don't delight in those. Otherwise, David said, I'd give them to you. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. Listen to this, though, verse 17 of Psalms 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. And I think about like, like that is encouraging to me because it's like God is not ask me to perform anything before him. All he's asking for is that broken and, and contrite spirit. And and I think that's the point of what Jesus is getting. I hear he's flipping the paradigm on these people because they missed all this. These Pharisees, they probably read Psalms 51 a thousand times, but they had not let that sink in to how they responded to God. God, is he, he wants a broken spirit and a contrite heart. That's what he does not despise. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to get across here. Um, you know, to no avail to some. No, I think that's such a smart point, Zach, because David is a great illustration of representing both the people in this story. He was the the Pharisee at one point, the hypocrite, yeah. as you describe. But then, when he got when he was broken, finally, because he recognized his guilt, he be, in Psalm fifty one is the he's the woman in this story. I mean, yeah. he's at he's at the feet of God, and he's like, "There's no other way." Lisa and I call it, we talk about Psalm 51, we call it truth vomit because he just pours out his soul 
about who he is when he recognizes it and you can't stop it. And so it's a beautiful picture of actually showing that you can be both. You can be Simon and you can be the woman at different points in your life. And David's a perfect example of that. I think it's a well, great it's, illustration. Yeah. Psalm 17, it, he, he goes before the Lord and the psalmist is asking God to judge him based on what he has done. He's like, I've, I've not done anything wrong. You read the, the contrast. Dad did this uh, uh, in the sermon yesterday. The contrast between Psalm 17 and Psalm 51 is like when he gets to Psalm 51 and his sin is ever before him, he's not like, hey, judge me based on what I've been doing. You know, I've been doing a lot of good things here. He's like, no, do not judge me based on what I've, I've done. Judge me based on your compassion. And I, I mean, it just shows the character of God in in that psalm and then and it shows how we can respond to god and as someone who is full of sin i thought man that is encouraging that that god's not going to judge me based on what i've done he's going to judge me and, and it, but my sacrifice is not what i'm bringing to him it's 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 the way in which i'm bringing it to him no, yeah that's good well i think they you know he when he told the story he basically said they both owed sums of money and they both had the debts canceled and really it it you know that wasn't his his point but the more you're going to read luke's accounts of these you're going to see these same kind of principles uh you remember the story of the prodigal son which really should be titled the loving father or gracious father or well, running had, father yeah you had one in the pig pen but then you had this older brother in the house you know <laughs> so you know who he's representing who couldn't participate in the joy of reconciliation because in his mind he had a self-righteous spirit kind of like a pharisee and then you have luke 18 which i think is the best parable on this where you have the pharisee get up this is 9 through 14 and he's like you know, they, they went up to the temple to pray, and the Pharisee got up and said, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other men, robbers and evildoers and adulterers, and even like this tax collector. You know, I fast twice a week, give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector, he wouldn't even look up to heaven. He, he beat his chest and said, have mercy on me, God. I'm a sinner. And then Jesus says, I'll tell you that this man rather than the other went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Which goes back to this Luke 6 and these the qualities of the prideful versus the quality of I the don't humble. I need you is not, uh, that, that's... That's the position you don't want to be. In. You don't want to be. That's why pride is I the don't greatest. Need you. That's that's the yeah is the greatest. Which is what this woman, got. what this woman had ran out of. I mean, I think about if you're in her situation, and you're coming into this setting. I mean, you got to think there's got to be an, a, a great level of intimidation on from her, you know, her part because she's thinking, man, I got to go in here and just get totally rejected by the by him because of who I am and what I've done. And especially in the face in the room with Pharisees and all this is going on, it's like you would think that, it, that Jesus would be like, "Don't touch me! Like I despise you. I'm repulsed by you." Which we can all relate to that with our own sin. It's why we don't come to God because we're like, "Man, if I go to God and and I and I expose my sin to Him as if He doesn't already know it, right?" But let's we and somehow in our mind we pretend like He doesn't know it. And man, if I really went to him and, and exposed this darkness in me, then he would despise me. And I, uh, that's just so encouraging that God, the scripture says it, that God does, he, that is not what he despises. What he despises is, is, is an arrogance that is re, a refusal to bring that. If you bring that to God, he, he will not despise it. He said, he promises that yeah. he will not despise a broken spirit and a contrite heart. No matter what you've done, no matter what wickedness is in there, God looks at that and says, I don't despise you. So I've uh, been hearing from our old friends at uh, Barrel Buddy. Uh, Jace, they're into cleaning your gun barrels, but they're also uh, brothers uh, in Christ. And so it's one of the things we like about it when our sponsors can align with sort of what we believe and how important the Bible is to us. That's a, that's a, a good thing as well. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, no doubt. Uh, you know, there's, you tend to run with those, that you're like-minded with. And so if you're a believer and you're a hunter, that that seems to be 
a pretty good thing. Well, that describes these guys to a T, and I've had a kind of an ongoing Bible study with one of their guys. It's just been really interesting. Of course, they're like us. They're small business, uh, hunting-based. Uh, they were out in the field and uh, a wet, muddy day and said, you know what, we need a better way to clean our gun barrels uh, so that we can make our weapons more efficient. And so they came up with the concept of Barrel Buddy, um, which is really these white polymers uh, that you see Jace has there. Uh, and it has a 3D cylinder, obviously, that you're working through. And so that's exactly what these do. They go in those polymers, they clean out all the particles that are there. They don't leave a big mess. Uh, and when you come out, you see the clean that you have. So it's a, a great product, a great idea by a great group of guys. And we encourage you to check them out. Are you gun enthusiasts? Where do you like shooting on the range or out in the hunt? Uh, either way, you need a barrel buddy. So check them out. B-A-R-R-E-L buddy. Barrelbuddy.com. It's the same principle of the planks, you know. You're trying to get something out of someone else's eye, and he's like, you got a telephone pole in yours. And it's not the amount of sins. It's the condition that if you have any sins, which all adults do, then you're you're hopeless. You're helpless. There's nothing you can do. The situation is dire. You should... You know, look at all means possible to do something. If there was any way out from under this, because you're not going to be able to do it. And uh, I think that's the same type of principle he's doing. I wanted to talk about a few of the controversial things of this passage, because this one is not read. You know, a form of this story is in all four Gospels. But this one doesn't seem to fit with the other three. Yeah, a lot of scholars think it's actually definitely two different occasion some think it's the same one told a different way but you're right jay's i read a lot about that in my yeah. study of this yeah this, me too the, the difference in the well, two it's easy to miss god made him jesus when he's talking to these pharisees and the people that are in and out god made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of god in other words they're going to have to at some point Say, I'm a sinner. Exactly. I think that's the point. Look, it's it's a. I mean, most religious people get this right, but I mean, you you must realize the dire straits of your own sin and the debt that is owed, and whether you're a believer or not, someone those consequences of those sins must be paid in some form of another. There's thousands correct. of illustrations that, that you correct. can use for that. Somebody's paying. Whether you're forgiven or not. Think about you it. Know, every sin that was ever committed from everybody, uh, up, and now we're looking at about 7 billion people on planet Earth, the whole load mm -hmm. are sinners. Well, exactly. All of them. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> how do you pull the ones who are sinners without faith in Jesus and without not being like these Pharisees right here. Well, exactly. Yeah, you know, if you you rob a bank or whatever, and you know it's a it's against the law, they'll catch you. And but if the banker said, "Oh, well, we're going to forgive you," well, all the people's money that is gone. You know, if they said, "We're going to forgive you," and don't worry about it, you don't have, don't have to pay us back. Yeah. Well, all the people that had their money stolen, well, they want justice. That's it. You can yeah. forgive them all you want to, but I'm out of where my money at, you know? Yep. And it just gives you a picture of the idea that's to a holy, just God. That's where the problem lies. And yep. you have to realize you're way worse than you, than you think you are. I mean, I, I, I'm not even saying no, you acknowledge you're a man. sinner. You're worse than you think. <laughs> yeah, or, or as you said, man, I have a hard time seeing that if, if you, if you want to know how you can see yourself worse than you really are is another way of saying that is he's way greater than you think he is. And so your reference point, I, thought, I had this conversation just this morning because someone at our church is asking the question, you know, why, why did he have to die? I and mean, why did Jesus have to die? Which is, I think a very good question, but I've thought I've, I've wrestled with that. Why couldn't God, God just snap his fingers and, and then we're all just in like, right. To I mean, he, to wipe them away. The sins. Yeah. He, well, yeah. that's one thing, but there's other there's other things. Go ahead, Zach. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, it's it goes back to this idea you mentioned of justice. 
And the first thing that pops in my mind when I think of justice is there that statue of the blind lady, the blind scales of justice. And she's, it's like, she's, if she's blind and she's got two plates on each side of her hands as she holds them out. And then there's a chain that goes up to the top. And, and the idea is if there's an imbalance in that scale, then that's injustice. And the way that you bring that justice is you make it even. So if you break my window, well, that's a crime you committed against me. You need to pay for the window, a little community service, and you know we're we're even. But but what if you what if you murder my child? Well, then you know I mean then the the the, the, the punishment the crime has to has to the punishment has to fit the crime. And I think where we have a hard time understanding with God is why is my sin worthy of death? You know Romans three twenty three and Romans six twenty three. You talk about this a little bit, and I think that. The reason I think the reason why that is is because you're you 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 have to compare yourself to to a holy God who is infinitely good and mm-hmm. infinitely glorious. That's who your sins against. So you the distance between you and Him, that scale, that chasm, that that imbalance, it's it's infinite. And the oh. only sacrifice you can't pay it. The only sacrifice that could pay it would be a, a sacrifice that's infinite. And the only thing that's infinite is God. And so. That's why God had to die for us. That's why. Yeah, that's why he, he became a man. I agree with that one hundred percent. You you can't if if you're gonna have a God, not like we invented this one, but I'm just let's just give people who don't believe, you know, so, some some thoughts here. If you're gonna invent a God, well, and he's gonna be holy, he can't like ten thousand years from now all of a sudden think differently about evil if he's infinite and he's holy and pure well if we all got to heaven because this is what happens in human life everything can be rolling along but guess what just wait for it and somebody's gonna screw up everybody's gonna get mad and you know this is just the cycle you watch movies you see the rise of celebrity and what happens and the agony of defeat it, it just always mm. ends it just doesn't end well. So God's not, he can't all of a sudden change his nature and coexist with evil behavior. That's why there's a separation when we sin. You know, that famous verse in Isaiah, sin separates us from God. Why? Because because he's holy. So who moved? We moved. That's why to the human race through Jesus and all of the ones he hired to go preach the gospel to their death, that's why it's characterized as a mystery. It's it's so well right. The so, mystery so is it is a mystery. well. How does this powerful of God? How can he suffer and submit and surrender? Well, he can. He's too big. He's too. That's why. So when I read that First Timothy six in our last podcast, I think it was the bonus time because it was the crux of my presentation at the Faith Family Freedom Day. It, there's an obscure end of that phrase in, in the end when he says he's the eternal uh, king of kings, lord of lo- lords. And then it says, and he lives in unapproachable light. Mm-hmm. Well, it, that's kind of scary. That means we can't approach him. And there's a, there's a chasm, one, from our sin, and there's a chasm of, of power. And so you say, well, if he's unapproachable... Well, how am I supposed to approach him? And that's where Jesus comes in. Because here you have a God who doesn't have these qualities that is needed to save us. And I mean by submission and surrender, because he, he, what is he going to surrender to? He, he's, he's, so, he's unapproachably powerful and beautiful and glorious. And the famous C.S. Lewis line in Mere Christianity, who goes through all that, it's not in his nature to do that. But if he became a man, now all of a sudden we have the possibility of suffering, of surrendering, of submitting. And so you you see where I'm going with this. That's that's why Jesus, the Son of God, became a man to save us and become the bridge because yeah. you can't have a relationship if we're separate. And, you know, it's like it's like a couple. They say, well, let's separate. Well, I can tell you this, and I'm not a counselor, but I know this. 
unless you reconvene at some point in some way, you're never going to have that relationship again. Uh, Either yeah. somebody's going to have to write a letter yeah. or you're going to have to see each other. or there's Somebody's going to make a move. There's got to be a move. And the point is that, he made the move. All this prep in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all that prep is getting ready for the writers who went to their death, the Apostle Paul and Peter and all of them. I mean, when they started out, I mean, it was in lieu of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus was here and answering all these questions about sin. You know, it just, yeah, it, it's explained yeah. in detail time after time, but, every but letter. You start backing what? up and see you have to get together to have a relationship, but you also go before that. You have to have a choice to have a relationship, and you have to have restraint. Because yeah. think about it. Yeah. If like if I choose to be married, you know, to my wife and she goes along with it. But if there's no restraint, which is where sin comes from, well, what kind of relationship is that? Well, she it's not gonna last long if if I'm not loyal to just her. She's gonna say, What do you thought? I thought you loved me. And I've made a choice to not show restraint, you know, with other women and what happened? Well, that is sin. I mean, actually as it is, but well, she doesn't she she feels betrayed and so then you're like, Well, how are we gonna repair all this? And now you're getting an innocent, sinless God in human body being sacrificed, blood being shed for yeah. unrighteousness. And sin. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he came up. Yeah, because the infraction, the infraction against God is there. there is, like, when you look at your situation, there is no way to make it right. I mean, you, you, have, you don't possess, the, the, the penalty was too great. That's right. I mean, the, the crime was just, it was just, it was so great. And you, know, yeah. I mean, you may think, well, it wasn't that bad to me. Well, no, but you sinned against a holy God who was infinitely good and infinitely loving. And when you mentioned earlier about, you know, God not violating his nature, yeah, I think that's important caveat that we should, you know, God can't do anything like we, I mean, he can't violate his own nature. Hebrews 6 says he can't sin. And There's he certain can't, things God he can't, can't lie. Do. He can't lie. He can't lie. Yeah, he can't so, lie. He can't. It's not because he lacks the power. It's like these things are incoherencies. They don't. You, God can't do what God cannot. He can't be not God. I mean, he just can't. And so I think when you look at our position in him or, or away from him is that we, we've sinned against him. And that and that yeah. is and there is no way to pay for that. I think these moments of what like David went through when he was confronted with his sin, he knew there was no way to make it right. No, that's right. the whole Psalm. I mean, the whole Psalm is I got nothing. You know what I mean, yeah. like I got one move and my move is just to say, I got nothing. And, yep. and God does it all. And it's the same kind of spirit that this woman had. And it, the woman at the well, I mean, all these people that Jesus loved on, it was like, it was never the people who had all the sacrifices set up. Right. And it was never them. It was always the ones who, yeah. had no sacrifice other than that broken spirit and contrite heart. Well, to your point, the person who asked you why Jesus had to die, so yesterday when I was on the back porch doing my gospel presentation, and there's a few hundred people listening, I opened it up to Q&A, you know, after, which in hindsight, probably I shouldn't have done that because the first couple of questions were just like, controversial religious questions. You know, one of them was about the women's role and, Another one was, you know, why do preachers say that God told them to do something? And, and the only reason I'm bringing this up is because I answered them, but I said, look, you, you have, Jesus has to rise above this. You know, I said, we've done podcasts on that. We discussed that. But we're talking about who, you know, how you view Jesus. Well, the next question was, well, why did Jesus have to become a man? And it was the same question that really Zach was posed to him it was just done differently and i quoted because we were studying luke 7 i quoted this verse uh 49 or 48 that says then jesus said to her your sins are forgiven i said the reason we bring this up is how can a man be saying your sins are forgiven unless he was god 
and uh and and it was just kind of it was a kind of a, everybody just went into a hush and i was like you're you're taking for granted a human could make this statement that a red flag should go up and say wait a minute now how would he be able to say that and that's what riled them up because they're saying who is this who even forgives sins well why is jesus doing that and it's the same uh view in reverse on why he became a man he became a man to come save us so he could suffer so he could be sacrificed you know because of his love but he's also saying that to say i have the ability to do this because you sinned against me i am god there's a god and you're looking at him Mm -hmm. and that's the difference and that's why jesus is the king of kings Uh, you know only he has that kind of authority because he's sinless he's eternal he can fix these problems that we can't fix. But part of the part of that is you acknowledging how low you are. You cannot fix it. So there's always a temptation that even when you're forgiven, because this doesn't go away, you know, out of the church. There's always a temptation that when you get your life, when he cleans your life up, all of a sudden you start saying, Oh, well, I'm pretty good. I'm I think I'm so good that I'm not gonna associate with mere sinners and because most people believe that this was the town prostitute. Do you agree, Al? Uh, that this, that she had lived, now it doesn't say that, but it says a sinful life. When you life. say she's lived a sinful life, I mean, it had to be something everybody was aware that she had lived a sinful life. So the, yes, the assumption is she was probably a prostitute. Well, and I, I read, uh, I, I got this from Tim Keller, which, which I agree with with him you know when him looking at the culture this flask with the alabaster jar of perfume you got to remember this is a culture they didn't have air conditioning they you know there was no deodorant i mean so just think about this the life of a prostitute part of that lifestyle was having something where you smell good it was it was part of the job and it was very expensive and so it was basically he projected this is her livelihood because they wore them like necklaces. And that's how you knew who a prostitute was. They had an expensive jar of perfume on their body because they're trying to lure men to make money. And so she does a couple of real scandalous things that make people uncomfortable. That's the reason that when they preach on this story, they don't preach Luke's version because in their culture, when she let her hair down and, and was crying, well, that was grounds for a divorce in their culture. If a woman let her hair down in public, and the reason is because that's what prostitutes do. And so here she is in this, which is very uncomfortable, I'm sure, to this Pharisee, because you're like, what, what? You realize this is a prostitute letting her hair down in public putting perfume all over your feet. This is some kind of weird thing that I don't want to be a part of. He's thinking this is a scandal. I don't know who you think you are, but no religious person would be allowing this to happen. Plus look, no one touched no one touched feet except for the the extremely lowest of low servants. I mean, that was just another DED. You never did that. So you're right, Jace, it's it's even scandalous, you know, how much is there. Well, it is, and the reason he's doing that, and this story is in here to show utterly that God is and can redeem everyone. And the one great quality, and you see this even in, look, when you, I'm involved, you know, I speak at Celebrate Recovery a lot of times, but there's a lot of religious people, they wouldn't be caught dead in there, because it's uncomfortable. These are new Christians who have had, really terrible uh, decisions that have happened in their life. And, but they're very emotional and they're very, they do things like this. They make you uncomfortable. Some of them are not dressed appropriately, you know, and you're like, well, I can't even believe you'd go in there. But when you read this story, you realize, look, this is, this is who Jesus is for. We're just as bad. It's not the how many and which one. You have plenty of verses to support that, even with the the plank in the eye. That you know, James said, if you're guilty of one sin, you're guilty of breaking all of it. Well, how can you make such a statement? Because you're in the same condition, but you're just hiding it around 
you know, what Isaiah called, uh, you know, dirty rags because you, you know, you're wiping the sin off, but you're, you, you, it doesn't work. <laughs> you're kidding yourself. Yeah, you can't possibly remove it. So we're out of time, uh, but we do want to talk a little bit more about this. I've got a good sermon I've been working on listening to you guys talk, and I want to talk about that. Uh, and what it what really is the biggest, uh, most amazing point in the whole thing we hadn't even gotten to yet from uh, Luke chapter 7. So we'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about that in our overtime segment, blazetv.com slash unashamed if you want to sign up and follow us over. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.